Thanks for tuning in to another installment of Advanced TV Herstory, a podcast that studies, analyzes, and celebrates women's roles throughout the history of television. Among thousands of comedies and dramas that have aired, strong women characters are still in short supply and hold valuable lessons for all of us. In some cases, good shows or characters of today can be traced to an influence that aired 20, 30, even 40 years ago. With an eye to aligning the leadership lesson, time capsule observation, or some fascinating backstory of a show's success or failure, my goal of advanced TV history is to connect the treasures of the past to the great potential of today's TV and online productions. Theme songs that prompt a smile, characters that make you want to stand a little taller, shows that defy social norms or expectations of how good women should behave, it's all here in Advanced TV History. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. May I have your attention? Before you go another minute further in this lesson, which I think of as Brenda Lee Johnson, Evolution of a Leader, please note this episode will contain spoilers for seasons one through four of The Closer. The evolution of a character, particularly a leader character and a lead role, is just that. The change in demeanor, style, and approach that comes through experience. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about those experiences and how it is that Brenda gets to be such a textbook leader. So if you aren't freaked out by spoilers or are already familiar with the first four seasons of this excellent series, please listen. Critically acclaimed and very well written, acted and produced, The Closer is totally worth viewing. This installment of Advanced TV History focuses on The Closer's first four of its seven seasons of production. The series is so rich that it really is worth breaking into two different segments of Advanced TV History. Brenda Lee Johnson is a rare female character in that the series begins with her assuming a leadership role, that of Deputy Chief within a division of the Los Angeles Police Department. Throughout TV history, women police personnel, which is to say government employees in a male-dominated field, rarely lead. We'll take a look at just what TV glass ceilings the closer broke and how Kira Sedgwick's character is as accomplished a role model as TV has ever seen. But before we can understand Brenda Lee Johnson's leadership traits, we need to know a bit about her background. Interesting circumstances and a unique resume bring her to the LAPD. We learn in the first season how her foibles play into her leadership growth. Some seem a little inconsistent and some reveal just a hint of real life, but they all serve as mechanisms to add color to the main plots, which are focused on high profile crimes. With that background, we'll put Deputy Chief Johnson's record of leading the Priority Homicide Division up to a leadership test using the standards set forth by the Leadership Challenge. The Leadership Challenge is a popular leadership curriculum developed by James Cousis and Barry Posner more than 20 years ago and focuses on five timeless leadership principles. And I'll explain them in a little bit as we go along. So first, a bit about the show. From 2005 to 2012, cable TV network TNT aired an original drama entitled The Closer, which was a reference to the abilities of the main character, Brenda Lee Johnson, to close a case through interrogation and confession. It aired in 2005. So it's interesting to note American TV's fascination with interrogation and suspect handling. We were fresh off of 2003's international Abu Ghraib incident in which American army torture and abuses were revealed. We were beginning to realize the vast skills developed during this long period of international conflict were now being used by American law enforcement. Which is not to say that Brenda Lee Johnson served overseas, but rather she received training from the CIA. The show was Standard Cable's highest rated drama. Standard Cable's highest rated drama. That's pretty significant. It garnered 66 nominations for recognition of actors, the show itself, and production categories. Sedgwick was nominated more than 40 times by major award groups like the Screen Actors Guild, Hollywood Foreign Press Association's Golden Globes, and the Emmys. She won the 2006 Gracie Award 
for Outstanding Lead in a Drama Series, a 2007 Golden Globe for Best Performance by an Actress in a TV Series Drama, 2009's People's Choice Award for Favorite TV Drama Diva, and an Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Drama Series in 2010. The Closer was written mostly by men and occasionally directed by women. Lead star Sedgwick was also an executive producer of 81 of the total 109 episodes, lasting across seven seasons. Brenda Lee Johnson is smart, tough, irascible, and in her 40s. She doesn't suffer fools lightly, and for women across the country who are beginning to feel invisible at this stage of life, regardless of their qualifications, Deputy Chief Brenda Lee Johnson carries their torch. Brenda's flame may have inadvertently lit a fire clear over at a competing show on one of the major broadcast networks. Here's an interesting timeline and a theory that uh, has thus far been put forth only by advanced TV history. As The Closer premiered in 2005, Law & Order SVU was entering its sixth season on NBC. At that time, SVU's primary character, Detective Olivia Benson, played by the phenomenal Mariska Hargitay, was still processing cases with her partner and team. Little mention was ever made of her interest in promotion. By the final episode of The Closer in 2013, SVU's Detective Benson was still a detective, a highly decorated, occasionally admonished risk taker. It wasn't until the middle of the 2000. 13-2014 series that her own boss, Captain Cragen, played by Dan Florek, announces his retirement, creating the vacancy, which ultimately resulted in Benson's promotion. Now, some say that women have a hard time aspiring to and actively pursuing promotion. In her book, Lean In, uh, specifically on page 63 of the hardbound version, Facebook COO Cheryl Sandberg writes, Women are more reluctant to apply for promotions, even when deserved, often believing that good job performance will naturally lead to jobs. She goes on to write that experts in the field call this a Tierra syndrome, where, quote, women expect that if they keep doing their job well, someone will notice them and place a tiara on their head. Which got me to thinking, did Detective Benson suffer from Tierra syndrome? Did the closer's success pressure writers of Law & Order SVU to finally place the highly qualified, hardworking Benson in a leadership role? If there is any connection, then the impact of the closer really does cross over from the progressive shows that we've come to expect from cable network productions to male-dominated broadcast networks, which in recent years have minimized the role and promotion of smart women. So let's explore the character of Brenda Lee Johnson, who, at the very least, is a character. She gave me. As you know, we have an understanding, which is pretty much Excuse me, Dr. Dawson. Mr. Mr. Schiller, Brenda Lee Johnson, LAPD. Can I talk to you for a moment over here, please? The resume she brings from Atlanta to the LAPD is that of a CIA-trained interrogator and former detective with the Atlanta Police Department. We learn early on that she's had a prior relationship with Assistant Chief Will Pope, played by the even-keeled J.K. Simmons. After what we understand to be a spate of failures involving the LAPD's handling of high-profile cases, hmm, think uh, white Ford Bronco and questions around the chain of custody of a certain former football player's size 12 ugly-ass Bruno Molly shoes, Yes, Assistant Chief Pope lobbies for the creation of the Priority Homicide Division with Johnson in mind. The series begins with Johnson walking into the predominantly male, though relatively diverse, workplace known for its internal politics. Everything all right, Chief? What do you think, Sergeant? Not a rhetorical question. Where are Lynn and Provenza? Off duty? Clearly, they are not off duty because they're taking over crime scenes. Detective Daniels, get on the phone and find them. There. Now! Did I ever 
once imply that I would allow y'all to make up the rules as you went along? No. Definitely not. Not a chance, Chief. Are you aware that this is exactly the type of conduct I was brought to this department to end? Uh-huh. Definitely. Yes, Chief. Have you people heard of the word protocol? Brenda Lee Johnson is a focused professional. That same level of focus and discipline is used to keep the show pointed at the crime-solving plots. Plots don't delve much into the private lives of the secondary characters, and the few bits we see of Brenda's personal life are designed to help us understand the origins of her real and perceived shortcomings. Like so many professional women, she has a difficult time striking a work-life balance. Early in the series, when she's living alone, she talks by phone with her parents who live in Atlanta. Brenda usually winds up rattled, saying something wrong that she later thinks has displeased them. The viewer wonders if the unfulfilled expectations of Brenda come from her parents or herself. This makes her a very relatable character. Over time, her wardrobe transitions from mainly sweaters and skirts to a more varied array of suits accented by brightly colored accessories. Early in the series, her shoes appear sensible, but by the fourth season, she's in the field wearing high heels, slingbacks even. Since the first show featuring the first woman police detective, we've always judged their clothing choices for practicality. In an interview, Sedgwick attributes the wardrobe to a conscious choice that Brenda Lee presents the feminine Southern Belle, a woman from the South in a position of responsibility. Brenda Lee gets high marks, but I'm skeptical about who made the call about the heels. Whether as a cat owner, girlfriend, fiance, or wife, Brenda struggles. What is it about your character that you think draws people in? Like I, think, I think it's her flaws. I think it really is. She's struggling with so many different issues. She's brilliant at her job and really not so great in her personal life. She's just kind of a mess. She, she has this great intuition about people and absolutely none about herself. And she's just struggling to try to keep it all together. And I think that that's something that people can relate to. I think we're all trying to juggle it all. And she's also, you know, funny. She's funny. She's very funny. funny. Very funny. Yeah. She likes junk food. That's well, right. She likes junk food. Which we all can, can relate to. She's in the prime of her career. Urgent suspect interviews, meetings with informants, and scouring a crime scene are the priorities in her life. Fortunately for her, the cat and her boyfriend, fiance, husband, Fritz, are both very patient. And because Fritz is an FBI agent, he not only understands her drive, but occasionally is confronted by the same questions of priorities. Within what otherwise can be tense, gruesome episodes, light relief occasionally comes at Brenda's expense, and she takes it in stride. In season one, she's working hard to get information from a witness, a teen who we know to be autistic. The law, there has to be custody here first. Children's services takes care of him until then. But only for a few days. You mean a foster home? This is crazy. His father is dead. He should be with me. You have no idea the damage that this kind of disruption can do to an autistic child. It's horrible, Jillian, I know. But you have my word. I will do everything I can to get your son back to you as quickly as possible. What can we do to keep her from taking her son? Well, nothing. Children's Services will pick Keith up at the hospital and take him to his foster home, and then the courts will fast-track to custody hearing and get him back to mom. Can we slow them down? Do you want to prevent a mother from getting back her traumatized autistic son? He's either my one witness or my prime suspect. If she gets custody, she'll take him to Phoenix, and I'll end up having to extradite him. Wait, wait, wait. Earlier, you thought Hulk was the guy. Now you think the kid did it? They say the ability to hold two contradictory ideas at the same time sounds genius. Either way, I need more time with that boy. Okay, look, I can arrange for you to transfer Keith to the foster home. I'll buy you a couple of hours. Okay. Just promise me one thing. What? Don't touch him, because I hear he doesn't like that. Low-functioning autistics have no language skills. They cannot survive independently by themselves. Keith's not like that, according to his... School records, he's very intelligent, but he does have issues. He's unemotional, frequently says inappropriate things. He's very literal-minded. He gets fixated on minor details. He gets agitated when his routine is altered, and he's extremely uncooperative when anything or anyone gets in the way of him doing what he wants. Does he have a Georgia accent? But we can figure out how. <laughs> Each episode usually holds an ironic, sardonic, or quirky bit. Season 1 treats the viewers to an ongoing riff on how difficult it is for someone new to town 
to navigate in LA without a GPS. As a result, when time is a factor and she needs to be somewhere, she's either likely to get lost, need explicit directions, or ask someone more familiar with the roadways to drive. Another featured quirk, Brenda seems to have an odd relationship with food. The quirkiness of the character, was that there from the beginning? The Definitely. Um, there were definitely things that were there. The, the food issue was right. always there, or at least at the end. You know, at the beginning, she was always, you know, that first pilot, she was eating the yogurt and eyeballing the, you know, ice cream. <laughs> you know, from there, I just, it was fun to just run with it. You know, a lot of these clues I got in the script and some things were written and there was always the ding dong at the end. <laughs> but, you know, that was something that I felt like I wanted, you know, I, I said, you know, I want to keep this going because who in America doesn't have an, an eating issue, but what woman in America doesn't have an eating issue? I mean, very few of us don't. You know, I felt like that was something that was accessible. Sedgwick savors every bite with the moans of a porn star. Seriously, you can taste the chocolate. One more point about gender, however. In season one, she's assaulted by a murder-rape suspect. It's a reality check in many ways. This is a serious drama, not a light comedy about a lady with a southern accent. Sedgwick is on the small side, very fit, and yes, appears capable with a gun. But at no point do we get the sense that Brenda Lee works out much, lifts weights, or knows martial arts. This drama's action is more mental than physical. It's refreshing that the writers embedded these quirks and nuances into the character of Brenda Lee Johnson. They maintain the show's pace without becoming a distraction from the real plot, much like how we get to know any of our own co-workers. These attributes also mellow her edginess while in the mode. As a leadership consultant and adjunct professor on the subject, I'm always on the lookout for real-life examples of people from all walks of life who lead capably. Check any bookstore's business or management section, and you'll find a raft of books on leadership. The Leadership Challenge, written by Robert Kuzis and Barry Posner more than 20 years ago, goes deep into these five basic principles which leaders need to really get good at in order to bring out the best in their teams. So first, they must model the way. Yes, be a role model in their personal as well as professional lives. Second, leaders must inspire a shared vision. In other words, a leader may initiate a vision, but it's only through the entire team having a stake in it and seeing it as their own work that the vision becomes a unifying bond. Third, a leader has to challenge the process. In a sense, see the status quo and the opportunities for improvement that will lead the team closer to the goal and not be afraid to ruffle feathers in the process. The fourth principle is empowering others to act. Leaders don't micromanage or shouldn't, but rather have their followers trust and respect the work and knowledge of their followers so that they are certain that the plan or vision has been communicated to the team and the team can do its work. Finally, according to Kuzis and Posner, a leader must encourage the heart, and we do our best when we feel understood, listened to, and valued. It's nice to receive credit when it's due, and you'll see that in a few examples in the closer. So yes, I realize that strong women characters in TV aren't real life examples, but every once in a while, a TV or movie character presents a teachable moment. With a seven year series like The Closer, we're able to see Deputy Chief Johnson's character and leadership tested time and again. When viewed through the lens of leadership principles, Brenda's handling of every episode's big challenge or situation provides us a really well executed teachable moment. A leadership analysis of The Closer, specifically Brenda Lee Johnson's performance, shows growth in team building, assigning work, setting expectations, and ultimately winning each seasoned detective over, and all the while, improving the division's performance. Or, as was said of Ginger Rogers, she did everything Fred Astaire did, but backwards and in high heels. So while she's not a real-life male CEO or Wall Street pariah, Brenda Lee Johnson of the LAPD measures up well as a leader. Remember, even in TV's fiction land, she is one of very few women at that level of management. The proof of her success is in the stability and professional performance of her team while adhering to a classic bare-bones government budget. So about those principles of leadership, let's look at the first, Brenda Lee as a role model. 
At this very busy division of the LAPD, Brenda Lee Johnson works as hard as any of her peers or direct reports. Her team learns of her reputation and record in Atlanta through a Google search of Atlanta news sites. Here we go. Atlanta Sun News, Captain Brenda Lee Johnson, currently on leave pending investigation. Look at that. Look at that. Alleged sexual misconduct. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Matter referred to internal affairs. Johnson not available for comment. Well, it doesn't say what she did. Oh, come on. You're not defending her. Come on, admit it, guys. Hasn't she dropped just a couple of notches in your estimation? Yeah, well, she's gone up a couple of notches in my imagination. So what are we doing? <clears throat> Brenda was challenged early to declare her ethical run-ins a thing of the past, yet also model incredible talent. To achieve that, there are many points in her script where she asserts things must be done according to procedure, or she quotes procedure chapter and verse, or she just models how it's done right every single time. Deputy Chief Brenda Lee Johnson, Priority Homicide Division. For the record, Mrs. Wallace has multiple stab wounds on her body and defensive wounds to her hands. Could you document that, please? Here and here. In her role as a strong-willed woman, however, she sometimes, knowingly, sometimes not, steps over the line of authority, sensitivity, or protocol. When she seeds, cornered, accepting criticism from her boss and learning of what constitutes corrective measures, women viewers may share in her frustration, her isolation. Viewers must wonder whether Assistant Chief Pope, though, has given her nine lives in her role as Deputy Chief. There's something a bit unrealistic about the lengths to which he goes to preserve her command relative to the internal pressure he feels. He is a saint. From the very first episode, we sense from her direct reports and superiors that her style is counter to the LAPD's way. Second, Brenda Lee, does she have a leader's vision? In many episodes, she questions Chief Pope or her direct reports about why the Priority Homicide Division has been brought in on a matter. Viewers who work for the government can relate to the constant and unpleasant aspects of budget cuts. She's conscious of the workload borne by her team, leading them to work smarter for short bursts in order to close cases more rapidly than was done under the old structure, functioning more efficiently. Brenda's been made very aware of how expensive overtime is, and she uses that point to her benefit to keep the division's work focused on crimes that fit its service description. However, her expectations for performance are high, and for service provided by other county units, timely. Her energy in doing her work speaks to how important, worthwhile, and rewarding she believes it to be. Because she sets high expectations among her team and holds them accountable to details and standards, she really garners their trust through the first painful season. Thank you. Okay, we're all ready. Sergeant Gabriel, you should make the toast. It'll be good practice in case he ever decides on a career where public speaking is necessary. Sergeant, let's go, Sergeant. Um, mm. Let's go. Come on, Sergeant, and, and don't hold back. We already know you're a suck-up. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you, Lieutenant. That's very helpful. Okay, um, for keeping the team together despite some pretty hefty pressure, yeah. and um, for trusting her instincts about us too by the way for how she always works so hard to get her man i say hail to the chief the chief well that was some well y'all are a little bit like a little like my own oh for heaven's sakes <laughs> thank you and Right back at you. All of you. Woohoo! Cheers. Salute. Cheers. Salute. She returns that trust through celebration and commendation and reminds them that they are a unique unit within a community, Los Angeles, that knows high profile cases and the media's appetite for them like none other. The third leadership principle Brenda Lee Johnson is a challenger of the processes? Hmm. And is it this strength, I think? that Pope saw most when he recruited her out of her situation in Atlanta. Yes. First, she brought a CIA-trained interrogation ability to the LAPD, a distinct skill set. Her team observes her blending that art and science on camera while she's in the interview room, learns how their work fits into this exercise, and has grown more savvy to her thought processes. 
She's taught them over time that an interrogation is not a fishing expedition. Instead, it's theater during which, with all your details and assumptions in order, you methodically play your cards to the subject. And as Sedgwick told Tavis Smiley in an interview, the Southern accent is its own tool. Why um, was the accent so important? Well, she was from Atlanta. Right. Um, but I also really felt that it was part of what disarmed people and mm -hmm. made them underestimate her. Yep, few suspects can match wits and nerve with Deputy Chief Johnson. They usually confess or disclose without or before the presence of a lawyer, often believing she knows more than she really does. Confession delivered, case closed, you get the picture. Few women characters on TV have ever held such strategic and intuitive skills. Brenda is a thorough listener. She's brought to the LAPD to change the culture and starts by listening to what her detectives say and how they say it. She stumbles her way a bit through the first season, but makes the effort every good leader should to get to know and value each detective on the team. The most significant outcome of each relationship? Trust. That first season is hard to watch. I know I certainly cringed every time her style clashed with the team or its existing ways and was amazed that the higher-ups didn't clamor harder to get rid of her. Brenda Lee Johnson's experience builds her backbone to challenge and change the way in which her division of the LAPD performs its duties. She tries hard to keep her team out of department politics. She boasts of their success rate and greater community influence when presenting her budget. Whether through creative tactics or new technology, Brenda champions process improvement. Brenda Lee Johnson energizes her team for more productivity by empowering them to act and think, which is the fourth leadership principle we're discussing. In changing a culture that might have been previously competitive, Brenda's Think Out Loud meetings in their squad room builds the team as equals approach. By keeping each detective informed about the significant elements of a case, she helps them to see connections and learn from each other. Under Brenda's leadership style, they rise to a higher proficiency, helping solve cases. Here, Detective Tao collaborates with the chief on unraveling the significance of numbers that were anxiously repeated over and over by the autistic teen we had heard described in an earlier clip. GPS wasn't an option on a 94 Mercedes. This was an aftermarket upgrade. Usually, you only see a unit like this on a high-end yacht. I would have been right off Key Sally. Why is that? Because he's obsessed with geography. Always likes to know exactly where he is. Well, that's what's so great about this system. The judge had it set to turn on automatically, so as soon as you start the car, the voice comes on and tells you exactly where you are. That must be why I freaked out in my car. Mine doesn't go on automatically. But the coolest thing is how precise it is. It tells you exactly where you are in longitude and latitude to the thousandth of a degree. Okay, what's the longitude and latitude of Mackie's house? Three four point one one three north and one one eight point two nine nine west. Uh, what about Griffith Park, where we found the body? Three four point one three two north and one one eight point two eight zero west. Is all of LA? 34 north and 118 west? Most of it. A degree of longitude or latitude is pretty big. Keith was only saying the numbers after the decimal point. So 132 is really 34.132, and 280 is really 118.280. Griffith Park. The carjacker would have turned off the car to take the judge out, shoot him, and then when he turned the car back on, the GPS would announce automatically longitude and latitude. What about 124266? I thought that would have been the poker game, but... Our killer made another stop. But know this. Brenda Lee Johnson's no micromanager. No, sir. There's too much work to be done, and it all must be done right the first time, almost immediately. It is important. They, as a team, are important. And because she's assembling the puzzle sometimes in her head and often on the squad room whiteboard, she holds them accountable for their missing pieces. At times, they report obstacles to her that result in delays. 
but they are as tenacious as she is, focused on the goal. So she praises them for their workaround, problem solving, and endorses their creative or alternative avenues. So over the seven years, we see Brenda grow in leading her team as she's mastered the fifth leadership principle, valuing them as people. Similarly, she's come to value herself as a person, not just the occupant of a job. Having borne no children and residing now thousands of miles away from her parents, her personal life is fairly private, solitary. That changes over time as her relationship with Fritz intensifies. Further, as she works through trust issues with her detectives and builds the team to a point of high function, she's also seen them through personal or professional challenges that make these characters real. She comes to value Provenza's contributions, his deliberate pace of action, his history in the department. She does everything she can to thwart his talk of retirement, in part by appreciating him and tolerating his sometimes sophomoric remarks. But it's part of the fun. Brenda encourages the development of Detective Irene Daniels, a subordinate who appears in the first four seasons. Detective Daniels gains greater confidence and asserts herself increasingly over the years. There's never much overt celebration of sisterhood between them, but rather the camera catches through glance and the body language that Brenda believes in Irene. Like so many long-running procedurals, they do become a bit of a workplace family. Brenda rises to the role as matriarch in a very emotional scene during which Sanchez is shot by a sniper while protecting Provenza. Detectives fan out to capture the sniper while others, awaiting a police helicopter, provide first aid for Sanchez, who is bleeding badly and is having trouble breathing. We saw the three bullets level him. With blood everywhere and Detective Sanchez losing consciousness, Brenda accompanies him to the hospital, his bloody head in her lap. Oof, I get chills just thinking about the energy, the acting. This is the reason this show is so highly thought of and received so many awards from a whole host of organizations. As the show was completing its final season in August of 2012, Sedgwick was interviewed by The Hollywood Reporter. When asked what she will take away from having played Brenda for so long, Sedgwick responded, I admire her a great deal. I admire her tenacity. I admire her number one focus being the people that are gone and who can no longer speak for themselves. When asked about the notion that The Closer is a breakthrough show for middle-aged women, Sedgwick observed, I was 39 when The Closer started. It certainly wasn't intentional for me to have a groundbreaking show. It just happened to be. The idea that I can have anything to do with the possibility of more opportunities for women is wonderful. At the time, I didn't think big picture that much. I went where my gut tells me, whether the character seems interesting, and where the writing seems good. You take it a day at a time. That's what we did. Then it became a phenomenon. But you never know that going in. Kira Sedgwick, Advanced TV Herstory thanks you for taking it one day at a time and bringing Brenda Lee Johnson to life. Thank you for surrounding yourself with hundreds of progressive men and women who made the show and Brenda Lee Johnson so memorable and successful. Thank you. The American TV detective show will never be the same. In a future installment of Advanced TV Herstory, we'll look at the final three seasons, which contain storylines and challenges more fitting a leader who has evolved to a level of high performance. And in true fashion, Brenda rises to every occasion. So please stay tuned. You've heard clips today from interviews with Kira Sedgwick, found on YouTube featuring one with Russ Mitchell of CBS News in 2008, Tavis Smiley of The Tavis Smiley Show in 2013, and a 2011 interview at the Paley Center. Background music is found at freemusicarchive.org, and on this episode, you've heard Alistair Thompson's The Northern Song and Frozen House's Listen. Thank you to Grant Abrams for editing assistance, and to you, Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams.